Hola, community. It's Pablo asking us here with another blender today. 101. We made it past the 100, but the awesome news keep coming. There is like a whole new uh, multi res uh, tools for like sculpting and like even like some kind of hard surface modeling sculpting. There's news in the interfaces all over the place. So today, without further ado, my guest for today is. Hello, hello. Today we actually started a little bit later uh, than usual, five minutes, because I was in the live stream. I was prepared everything to go live solo, um, like in the good old days. But uh, Sivan was in the chat and was like, "Hey, do you want to join?" So yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, let's get straight to it without we with actually with first jumping into a little news for everybody that wants to try animation or shading or model like it really anything that you want to try in Blender and you all you never can find like cool characters to work with. Well, the Blender Animation Studio just released the second character of the Settlers project where you get these amazing little characters. Like the last one is amazing. It's called Gabby. Yeah. And it, what is it? It's like uh I don't know. They has so much personality. The rig is insane. He has like a uh like these eyes that are actually a um a shader so that's how you can tell like depth but it's oh. also the like the, i don't know it has some eyes so it's some meshes so you can see so animators can see it in the viewport but um the mater had to use like the new remesh modifier voxel remesh to mask out some part of i don't know like this is a uh wizardry <laughs> it's it's pure wizardry it's really yes however yeah wizards these kind of wizards are sharing everything so this thing for example i was talking about i was i looked it up yesterday it was here in the rigging face masking ring like, like sometime around like 11 p.m or so demeter uh, uploaded this video and i was watching it last night um, where you can learn about the face rig masking walkthrough it's so cool so I, I'm gonna drop it in the chat so people can see it. All this, again, the, everything here is free, as in freedom, because not only you can download it and test it and play and whatever and use it, but you can also use it on your own projects, even commercial projects if you want or anything. You can just do whatever you want with it. Just mention that you got it from here so everybody else can get it. Um, super nice. Or in other words, create a comment. <laughs> say where it comes yeah. from so other people can benefit as well all right um with that being said we can just jump into what's new in blender in the last uh it, since the last week but remember this is live and we're answering questions towards the end of the show so for that go to blender.today where you can see this thread by momotron thank you again momo for making it and uh you can already start asking questions even updated to our guest there's hello dr stuvo oh one of the questions so super super nice all right let's jump into it because there's um some serious stuff to to see here so blender blender um got some interface stuff got some uh, multi-resolution some performance the blender you're gonna try today is actually faster for playback than the render the blender from a few uh from a few days ago so first let's go by parts the first thing is blender uh, interface this one is actually a fix um I, I always like to point out fixes in case people are having like uh, and uh, like can recognize it's like hey it was happening to me for example polyline um basically the lines on the widgets for example on mac they were having some issues so that should be fixed now the um now here for example you can these lines in linux they were always fine but i think on uh, there were some cases where the thicker lines were look a bit weird i think it was on a mac that should be fixed so please check it out and if it's not working please report it um that, that's even for 2.83 that's i think is like the only thing i'm going to talk about regarding 2.83 because everything else is actually 2.8 9 2.9 
You know what? Something that we thought about doing in 2.8, but we needed, we didn't do it, was moving the stats of the 3D view into, like, from the status bar when we're thinking about this new status bar in 2.8. It's like, what can we shovel in there? Okay, like tooltips and stuff and reports. But, um, cheers, by the way. <laughs> um, but the stats always were a bit weird because. 3D data, objects selected, vertices and stuff, belongs in the viewport, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. For example, if you have a viewport with, um, with I don't know, local mode, where you should say, see some of the objects, you want to have the stats for this, right? If you want to see the objects, like the stats for everything, then you will go outside. But also, uh, maybe you are doing video editing, so why would you even care about polygons? Um, because you're, you're not even using polygons. So that would happen every, uh, every time. Not anymore, now there is actually a new overlay option that is disabled by default. It's a, uh, so that might be a bit surprising, I saw one guy reporting um, uh, like, Hey, where are my stats? 2.9 is broken. No, it's actually an overlay called statistics. Statistics, sticks, statistics. So now we can. But be, that is pretty cool. It's super nice because this is a very first implementation, and there's a few already some um, things that got addressed. But there are actually some glitches still. Like if you're using um, cycles, and this is known by the developers. But for example, oh, no, not rendering. But if you're using like the render view, now the text is overlapping. This is being worked on, so don't worry. But um, for example, local view, that's a feature request. Local view still doesn't update with the objects shown there. Um, also, people got very excited about this and were asking for like polys and um, like n-gons and pretty much all data you can have. Thing is, this can get slow, right? As a developer. Yeah, sure. And it's nothing you can really cache. No, no, not really. You're smiling and looking at the screen. What is going on in the chat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody is asking any free open source render farm. So yeah, Flamenco, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it takes a little bit of work to set it up locally, but you can use the cloud yeah. and it comes with it. It's, uh, it's, it's called Flamenco. Flamenco.io is a website where you can find more info about it, and there is a video from um, from Francesco that explains how to set it up. Okay, so moving yeah. again, sir, you were. Now, oh. is there a flamenco channel on Blender Chat? Yes, there is. It's called. And there's actually more more than just me. Uh, people helping each other out. So. Cool. Um. So for more info, go there. Then a, a few little thingies here that actually is gonna save some minutes of life for everybody. Two little, I mean, this why even mentioning? It's just that it's a big step for many. Two defaults were changed last week. The clip start, <laughs> this is so silly to be explaining this, but the clip start of the, of the video editor now is 0.01. If it's the first time you're seeing this, or you're new to Blender, it's like why does it, why does it even deserve time in the in the uh, round of updates? Is that this thing was 0.1 before, and because it was conservative, basically you couldn't get too close to the objects because it would start like clipping. But it was it was good for safety in case you were working with uh, I don't know you had an old graphics card or. It just wasn't very safe. Um, now I think more reliable this can become 2.01, which is still... Um, I mean, you can still get clipping. If you get too close to the mesh, you're gonna see some clipping, but not as much. Okay, there you go, there you got the clipping. But at least not as bad as before. Um, yeah, this, this is like one of the things I always change when I have a, a, a fresh new blender. I, I set the clipping start to something decent. Uh, I zoom in a little, little bit more so that I don't have that huge wide angle feel in the in the three D viewport. Especially back when the default was set to I think it was thirty five millimeters. Yeah. 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 Some people suggest to make it eighty. 
uh, so you don't get any much distortion with switching, but I don't know, I think 50 gives you a good uh, balance of both of them. What would you use? Yeah. If you are a photographer, what, do you, what would you use? Well, that defend, depends very much. Like when you're talking about uh, like regular camera millimeters uh, for like full frame sensor, then anything from 16 millimeters for like these huge wide landscape shots where you have something really interesting in the foreground and then you want to have the sweeping stuff going uh, going into the depth of the, uh, the frame. Yeah. Up to say 110-ish for portraits is really nice. I think the lens that I Very use flat. for my... Yeah, it's still pretty okay. Like if you go towards 200, 300, it becomes way too flat. Yeah. Um, the lens that I use on my Hasselblad for my analog photos is 110 millimeters. But that, no, wait, it's 150. I think it translates to 110 on a full frame sensor because the negative is so big. Um, yeah, there's... Yeah, like, there are so many discussions about what is good and what is not, and and how you can even compare the uh, the focal distances. Yeah, it's uh there was a nice uh, video or a gif actually, what shown like the same uh, person and all the kind of lens distance, distance and it just yeah goes, it changes really how you perceive and even it's it makes people more appealing. <laughs> I know. Oh, absolutely. Especially models, like I guess they don't want a wide angle because if you put them too close, then it makes the like their nose bigger and just deforms well, a lot. Unless it's a fish the, eye. The, the, well, the thing is, if you um, go as close to the photo as the camera was, things will look okay. So if you have this weird wide angle view of this uh, person with like a huge nose and, and tiny ears, <laughs> Uh, if you print that out and then you put your nose pretty much against the print, it will look normal again. Ah. Because you have the same perspective as, from up close that that, you, that photographer had. That's a good point. So, so it's actually more the, the distance that you have to the person that changes the perspective and not so much the, the focal length of the camera. Speaking of photographer, there is an add-on that is called photographer that it's adding so many little good features here and there for controlling the... Uh, it's free, by the way, it's uh, available even on GitHub and um, you can... Uh, you can... it gives you like presets for some of the settings of uh, like what you use on a camera but also has some very nice tools for like picking white balance from the from the scene. Mm. So it will change. Oh, that is cool. That's super nice. Uh, yeah. It has a lot of... Um, uh, presets for cameras and stuff but also for the realistic or more like physically realistic uh, lights physical lights so you can change not only by rgb the colors but also by kelvin and or the um, the power of the lamps by lum light, by lumens or that is also cool candela and there's <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I've also heard talk about uh, people working on making cycles a spectral renderer. I'm not sure if this oh. is going to be in a branch or or built into cycles itself. Oh. Uh, but when you talk about realistic light, then this is also important, of course, because it is. It, it changes how lights reflect and everything. Yeah, and uh, I like about this add-on, and I'm uh, actually giving it a shout out because um, he starts the video by saying that it would be nice to get it into Blender and would like the Blender Foundation to get it inside Ooh. Blender and because he's also been updating it a while a, a lot so you know every add-on could get into Blender basically because all the add-ons are they use a Blender API they're open source so Blender Foundation could just like go into like loop get them all and put shipping them in with Blender but that needs a maintainer right everything that you add to Blender needs someone to actually fix it over time and keep it running yeah um, so in this case, this actually looks like a good candidate, like um, like a node wrangler, you know, <laughs> but it can, but for photography. Yeah. yeah, no, that's pretty cool, and especially if if they want to maintain it and they want to have it in Blender and then keep working on it, that will be will be great. Yeah, that will be awesome. And I think also picking some of these settings and moving them into Blender is also a good idea. Uh, yeah. Keeping them as an add-on is also good in some cases because maybe this will work fine with, I don't know, with uh, 
with EV and cycles, but maybe it's not set up for other uh, engines. And if it's inside of Blender, then uh, I don't know. It's like more yeah. maintenance to do. However, this one works fine with Lux, even Lux render. Nice. So okay, side tracking a little bit, <laughs> but a good one. So we were talking about the uh, new defaults. There's another new default that would make um, track to or look at in other softwares, I think it's called, this uh, constraint that uh, keeps an, uh, an eye or keeps focus on another object. The defaults for that were that if you added the track to, for example, the camera, it would like, boom, look down. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it, it would, would always use wrong axis. Always, um, but especially because it's, it's you, you usually use this on a camera like maybe 80 90 percent of the time depends on what you do of course but yeah. in, on camera so now the camera slides have, have changed and uh, now this actually by default will start um will we'll look at the right right uh, position so you just need to pick the object and then if you choose a camera it would have the right direction so it's using minus set and uh, as a um, two and the app is Y. Nice. Why? Because Blender. <laughs> All right, so more news, more news. Let's see. The uh, Outliner has a new delete operator, but it was mainly, it was like half a fix um, that basically before you could, it, it, was, it came from a bug report actually about um, the, um, the Outliner having a different operator for deleting a, a, collections and objects collections reacted to like delete key or uh, x but objects didn't in a so in a different way so that was not yeah. consistent now it should be more consistent so now that that's uh that's better then if you are uh the search menu the new search menu if you are uh, using the developers extras option now all the operators are gonna be uh, shown there they're gonna be part of that um, that uh, search the menu search i don't know if this should be even part of blender itself maybe like it, it will list some things twice maybe it needs to be smart or something but the search now is searched by menu but not the operators yeah. And now if you have the developers extras option in the user preferences on it will show both of them so it will show like okay. reload. so for example here shows reload scripts which is available in the, in the blender system menu but also it's part of like it shows the actual operator name mm. and, and, oh actually it's very nice for if you're developing it shows you the path of the operator so like so like add object then you can see oh that is dot. that's pretty cool yeah it's yeah. like an, another way of uh, it should show yeah it would be nice it, it would show actually maybe the whole path or like you can right click copy or that kind of stuff oh just hover control c that would be great yeah i think in, in blender's control shift c to copy the path um, a data path, yeah, but when you're in a menu and you want to copy the operator, then it's just Ctrl-C, Ctrl-V. Ctrl-C, yes. So for yeah. those that didn't know, actually, if you have developer extras option enabled, you can uh, right-click copy data path or use Shift-Ctrl-C and it's going to copy the this thing that you see, the mesh dot or use auto smooth, for example, in this case, or whatever the RNA um, path is for that. Another update for uh, in the um, last recap video and last previous previous Blender Today live stream, I mentioned how the now how now in the material properties the input has the color and the socket on the right on the left side, but it's the right way of doing it. <laughs> so um, inputs are always on the left, so now it always shows on the left. Now the right side will show the animation or like the keyframe um, little icon here so now you can actually tell now before if you would have the circles on the right side and the other circles maybe the icon is just not good really good but uh the uh, it could be a bit confusing not anymore nice very nice um grease pencil 
in when you're in Grease Pencil, now you can access the material from the context menu. So, for example, say you are you are drawing. It's very nice drawing, and then you can right click, change the active material to whatever you're using. So it makes it simpler to to change the material that you're painting with while you're painting it. Or you can also hit the U key and that would actually give you another kind of menu which directly with the with the name of the of the like the list of active materials so there is two new ways of changing the active material you're going to paint with right click context menu and the y key oh no sorry the u key which is cool because now being in a menu you can now click the accelerator key for example you can do u and then D for dot strokes, U, D. Or you can do U and then S for solid or Q for squares. And uh, if you remember the your material is actually a very nice way of working. And that's all. I actually had... <laughs> there is an improvement done uh, that is being worked on for proportional editing. And it was committed to master but it was reverted afterwards so it was committed i added it to the list it's like oh that's nice and then it was reverted <laughs> so i couldn't uh -huh. so i i have it here on my on my list but it's actually not really uh, not really there yet all right changing topics the topic is the node editor so who here uses node wrangler okay everybody Good news. <laughs> Everybody uses who not, who doesn't use the Node Wrangler? Node Wrangler is that add-on that adds a lot of useful stuff to the uh, Node Editor. That many of them should be part of Blender by now. I think we all agree. Um, but it's a good staging area for adding those features. The one of the great features that Node Wrangler has is the ability to show you the preview. Like uh, you can Ctrl Shift click on a node and it will connect like a preview of that node, which it's kind of a hack because basically it's just an emission node with the connected to the viewer. It's like a temporary thing. Um, maybe that's why it never made it into Blender itself because it's uh, really a hack. But this hack wasn't working inside of groups. Not anymore. Now no Wrangler works inside of groups. So yeah, Richard says Wrangler is awesome. Yes. Think Bomb asks, is the new multi -res in nightly builds? It should be. Yes, it should be. I think. Otherwise, wait until tonight. I think the build bot updates at 2 a.m. every night, uh, Central European time. So that is in like eight hours. Or so, all right. And uh, this news that maybe doesn't appeal to anybody is that Ghost initial Wayland support. It's exciting for Linux users because Wayland is the next, uh, the next display server that every Linux user is going to use, eventually. It's much more modern than the X11, but it's very behind in development, in like in general. Um, I was looking at the list of the KDE uh, Wayland showstoppers, and there is a bunch, including mm -hmm. support for like pen, Wacom. Uh, ah, who uses pens? Who uses? Actually, yeah. on, I was reading it on Reddit, a lot of people are just like, ah, that's minor stuff. And it's like, oh. well, if you're not in the artist community, then yes, but uh, um, yeah, no, I can see how it's not uh, very exciting for a lot of people. But yeah, for us, it's pretty exciting. All right, time to switch into performance in Blender for playback or CPU usage of certain tasks. There is a new task scheduler, which I know nothing more than just what the <laughs> what the commit says, but basically by looking at the uh, at the commit message, it's a new it, it's a library by Intel that Blender is now using for uh, some for only one thing, but apparently it's promising because this library has many more uh, types of of task schedulers, which can actually Blender can take advantage of. So basically, in Blender, everything is a task, right? Everything is like a job. Uh, Sibra? Sorry, I was I was just I know the, the chat is that. a bit uh, exciting sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so tasks. But yeah, the task scheduler. Yeah, 
what is a task? Uh, how, what, what do you consider a task and why do we need a task scheduler? Oh, poo, like all kinds of stuff. Um, things as simple as the little preview icon that you get in the material uh, viewport, like the material editor. That tiny icon yeah. in your materials list, that is actually a render of a built-in scene in Blender. And rendering that is a background task. Every time you, you change something in your material, it fires up the renderer again and then it's does stuff. Time. Yeah. So that's just one example. One example. But for example, here, um, like playback. Playback is not just the one task of playback, right? It's like maybe calculating all the modifiers or like updating the, the UI or oh yes like uh, as, as many as much as multi-threaded as we as we can so that things are running parallel that like the rig of one character and the rig of the other character can just be evaluated at the same time so this is what it benefits and this is the uh, test that was done on for example one shot from spring which is a like high resolution and it has a, a couple characters this shot for example with a Linux, Linux uh, with a Xeon running Linux, the FPS, so the frames per second, went from 12 frames per second to 17. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. That's 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 a lot. Maybe it doesn't look yeah. like a lot, 12 to 17, but that's a lot. But just not doing really anything. It's a library taking care of uh, doing yeah. this for for that's us. That's fantastic. So you're getting like a boost out of nowhere for free. Then um, in this test, then with the, so that was with a um, with a Xeon, Intel Xeon. But also, if you're using an AMD, a Threadripper, for example, here in a test from the Asian 327, the test went from around 10 frames per second to 14 frames per second. That's also very nice. Like 40 percent speed improvement. That is really good. Really good. Really good. So more of this, please. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Keep on coming. Um, uh, it's nice that here Brex says like a promising one improvement is to use the TBB graph that can be used for the depth graph, draw manager, so the viewport stuff, and the compositor. Whoa. Nice. And the depth graph. So everything is the depth graph is everything. So <laughs> yeah, very exciting to hear that. If uh, okay, switching uh, switching topics completely to tracking slash VFX. If you use uh, the the tracker and you use the distortion models, where you can like undistort your your scene, your your camera, you can now have used the um, a preset that it's meant to be used for like Nuke or Natron. So implement new new natron distortion model and the new model is available under the distortion model len menu in lens settings so it was going to be a um, big improvement if you're using this either one of these two softwares to work with blender back and forth and okay i think we need to move into the exciting thing now what everybody <coughs> is talking about sculpting so the big news this week they're all related to multi-resolution. Multi-resolution is this uh, modifier that has been bl in Blender for a long time. It's uh, it's nothing new really, but it's it was kind of broken for the last few Blender <laughs> versions. Um, for example, sculpting on a lower level and then moving into a higher level, the changes wouldn't propagate. So in the subdivision oh. levels. It was working so badly that in the last version of Blender, that option got removed, like hidden from the <laughs> interface. So, yes, so you yeah. can basically use it. And I think that's for 2.83, uh, it's gonna ship with that. I'm, I have to check, but I think I think that it's uh, that affects 2.83 because the okay. change to get it working for Sculpt is so big that it doesn't make the cut anymore because 2.83 is in beta, so we shouldn't be changing to batch of a thing yeah however <laughs> this has been done so for people using blender 2.9 you can now uh, uh, sculpt again and i uh, sure there was a video here but i can't find it um mm. so yeah basically the uh, or maybe it was in pablo de barros twitter that's uh that's the new blender docs <laughs> pablo db606 <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I, by the way, today I talked with Pablo Duarro to about making a um, video 
for showing all these new features and we are uh, maybe preparing it for like next um, next week maybe Monday we have to we have to first define it but I think it might be Monday let's stay tuned to the to the uh, social media but basically you can now now this is the operator um, here, probably the most important my milestone in Sculpt mode so far, Blender 2.90 has smooth detailed propagation, so that means that you can sculpt in any level. Now if you actually go into, um, if you start sculpting and apply a uh, modifier or use a modifier on the resolution, you're gonna see the sculpt slider again. So you can actually go back and forth if you enable the wireframe you're gonna see it much better so you can basically just like subdivide back and forth and whatever you sculpt in like the lower um, the lower levels is gonna propagate to the higher levels and you can also make changes in this level and then you can go back and the changes will propagate back that is really cool. That is wizardry. Yes. So that was um, that was the work of many people. That was uh, Pablo did the, the, the final tips and like changes and stuff, but also it's all the work that has been done before by um, by, for example, Sergey. Sergey. Sergey yeah. worked on the like he broke his brain <laughs> working on the multi resolution. <laughs> Um, together with Brecht helping out with the uh, with the design of it, there is even a video that I posted on Instagram once with the Blender account uh, showing Brecht and Sergey before the quarantine started, um, that like discussing this and writing on the boards about how multi-res should work, and also this part of this was also uh, done by uh, helping by helped by Bastian working with the undo system because this has to also support the undo system. So yeah when you see something like this look at the big picture and look at all the developers that actually work to get this done uh, oh yeah it's really the work of many many people and uh yeah and also if you see here hashtag dev fund it's because this is done via the blender development fund so if you're uh by the way happy to ta uh, four thousand subscribers members wow we that is great four thousand members of the blender development 4000 thank yous to all of them yes plus all the 37 corporate accounts of course but you know you can see how big is the community of uh of uh actually 69 percent of of it actually no okay 24 percent of of all income comes from individuals so thank you so first propagation you can now sculpt in any level, go back, up and down in the level of detail and they will be propagated. Not only that, but there is two new um, options in this modifier where you can, one, rebuild the subdivisions. So if you, this mainly works when you actually come from, when you bring a, um, an object um, model from another software, it really helps. Or maybe from an older Blender version, so you bring it from another that, that doesn't have so many subdivision levels. This is gonna rebuild them using magic. <laughs> and then uh, you can start sculpting from there and add more levels and back. Oh, that is so good. There is a very nice video. Hmm? I think this j then just does like a, a frequency separation. So you get on one level, you get all the chorus shapes and then on every new level, you get more and more detail. And this is used a lot in photography to split up a photo into like the chorus lighting and everything and then a middle layer and then all the fine details like pores on the skin and, and all the yeah. sharp edges. And to be able to go in through that middle layer and, and fix up things there while maintaining all the fine detail that is so good and so important. So I important. think something similar to 443 d models, I think it's, it will be amazing. Yep, so basically here you can uh, bring models from another place uh, or even like sometimes dealing with a lot of vertices can be very heavy. So you can uh, basically just go down the levels, sculpt all the big 
shapes and move all with just handling less polygons so it's even faster so it's an improvement in performance if you see it in that way as well because you can do some changes in lower um, poly count and that will propagate so together with that now there is a new feature also for and subdivide so it means that you can uh, uh, the same way you can subdivide and add more resolution to your to your mesh you can remove um, resolution from your mesh by hitting the uh, subdivide so it says rebuild a lower rebuild a lower subdivision level of the current base mesh so that works when you are at the lowest uh, point and then you will rebuild rebuild it there is a nice video here you can see the task is d7372 and last but not least is the subdivide simple and subdivide linear two new types of subdivision one of them was already there is the subdivide simple which basically is just um, subdivides without any kind of uh, smoothing so it will take every face and it's gonna make four faces out of it and back and forth it's really great for hard surface um, sculpting so for like rocks stuff or even models or even anything that is hard surface, hard edges. And subdivide linear is also part of this patch where you can read more in 7, D7415 or in Pablo Dovaro's Twitter. <laughs> also show that feature. I think we are close to the... Yes, I think we covered everything. It's a good moment right. to dive into the questions. <laughs> Let's sections. do that. Let's do that. Let's do that because we haven't. Last week, actually, I didn't take any questions uh, because it was one the episode one one hundred of uh, Blender today. Yes. So I bet there is a lot of things people want to know nowadays. Let's go. So here, I just loaded fresh. There's twenty four comments. First one says, "Hello, Pablo, and hello, Doctor Stuval. I just want hello. to give more attention to Dorian." The guy who made the incredible scatter add-on who created a thread about particle hair. Feedback based on Blender on your Blender today with Daniel Bystead. So that was Tuesday already. Feedback. He also released a level of detail add-on which can lower the resolution of meshes and he digged deep into hair particle. This could be an interesting for uh, be very interesting for um, Daniel Bystead and Sebas. Sebastian Barczyk, the developer working on it. Wow, I haven't seen actually this thread. Let's go through it. That's cool. Yeah, with the group texture density inconsistencies with nice images and text and bullet points and wow. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, that's a lot. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do this kind of uh, yeah. feedback. Awesome. Particular feedback. I don't know. We should we should poke the, the developers for that. <laughs> Don't read this now. No, we won't. We no, won't. no, we won't read it now. It's just that uh, it's uh, very very. Uh, it, when you see something like that, it's not just like a rant with a boom without any spacing or. <laughs> it's actual, you know, like okay, this could be improved this way or this way. Uh, it, yeah. Everything adds to, especially people with experience in the topic. Everything adds to the, to make it nicer for everybody. Next question. Hi, Pablo. Hi, Dr. Steven. Can you please make a tutorial on for how to download, compile, and submit a diff file for Blender source code? Uh, it's a good idea well, for the is. code dive. Yes. Yeah? What? yeah. That, there is already documentation on the wiki about this, and it's just a matter of going through it. But because there are so many different ways in which you can do it, I think it's not, uh, not the easiest tutorial to go through. Maybe it's not very um, practical uh, for a video. It is quite... Yeah, I mean, we could do a video about it at some point. But, th but the thing uh, is... Uh, sorry, but the thing is that if it's in text, you can see, like, okay, I'm on Windows, Linux, Mac. I can see you can copy-paste the commands, and basically a lot of waiting until you get all the code from the, from the Blender sources, then the compiling every time there is also code, um, that wait, waiting time. So for a video, it either takes a lot of editing <laughs> or... That's fine. Uh, you, you don't want to see the, the edits of scripting for artists. Like it is, like it cut every sentence or twice per sentence. It's, I can't speak normally when I'm scripting. Uh, I'm doing scripting for artists. Uh, 
So editing is fine. But like you, or as you said, we can only make a video about one very specific case. So that would be Linux because, hey, we're Blender. Yeah. Um, so it would only be Linux and then uh, only one build system. So we have to choose between Make and Ninja. And like already there are choices. Um, to choose all the... And why, why there are options even for building in like uh, Ninja or CMake or Make or... Why? Why? Why are oh. why are there options like just uh, yeah, sure. like why even there are options? Why not just? Isn't there one I to think, rule them all? Uh, for me, that's Ninja. Um, but many people are more comfortable with Make because they've been using it since forever. Um, and when I hand write uh, a Make file for like smaller projects, like for my electronics, I can embed it project with just a handful of C files. Then, I, because I know Make, I've used it all my life, basically. So it's comfortable. It's like home. Yeah. But for Blender, Ninja is actually better because it runs faster and it, it just produces less less stuff on the screen. So it, I kind of like it. Hmm. I didn't know about Ninja until I compiled a software called GL Mixer. GL Mixer is an open source software for mixing videos and stuff, kind of VJ. And um, they, it had this, it was, first it was ho hosted in SourceForge. <laughs> uh, and then it was, um, but I loved it actually. I really liked the, the project. It's a one person project. I reported a, a request and he made it like in the same day. Uh, super nice. But yeah, I ran into this ninja thing. What is this? Do I just type ninja? Bam, it worked. Compiled, yeah. created it, didn't have any uh, dependency issues or anything. So yeah. Anyway. A uh, little plug to GL Mixer. It's very nice. It's open source. Um, let's move into what is. Uh, let's see. What is uh, the next question? So the next question, actually, I was just plugging, by the way, your scripting for artists training, which oh. has got a new video you uploaded today. Yes. This morning, yes. As it linking. It's. Uh, yep. So it's about linking stuff from other blend files. Um, I've actually taken a few files from the Settlers project oh. and use that as an example on, on how to link uh, the assets to build an, uh, a shop or uh, an environment. So in the end, what we end up with is our own add-on that can load all the asset definitions from a JSON file. So you basically say from this blend file, load these um, collections from that file, load those collections. And then it just links everything in and instances it into the scene so that you have your overview of all the assets that you have, and then you can actually start set building. But all that importing and linking and instancing and setting up collections, that's all done automatically for you. Code. That's amazing. Yep. So for people that maybe are not familiar with this concept, is uh, set building is very common in every um, studio like either big studios of course but even uh, smaller studios or uh, productions uh, set building is essential because building by hand not only is prone to errors that you can make for human errors um, building by hand stuff but also all the name all the naming of the scenes and the linking the right characters and the right versions and setting up everything from render settings to like the characters in their own layers collections sub collections and everything it's something that it has to be automated. And um, we even haven't ever done this, not for Spring, not for, like, there is no open movie project where we had a script to build our scenes. So we, we need to look I, at I, this tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> I actually actually asked Andy, like, hey, I find this asset.json file in, in the Spring repository, but I can't find where is it used. Like, which software did you guys use? Uh, no. That no, the intention was there, but uh, yep. we never got to use it. And this is so essential, everything. And also because if there's something wrong with the scene, you just nuke it and just like, boom, rebuild it again. Uh, yeah. I, I, I know I had a, uh, I met a guy working at um, some big studio, I think it was Sony or something like that. And they, they said like every time they open the scene is like built from scratch. It's not like you save a blend file and you just save this blend file for you. It's like every time you open it, it's rebuilt. 
it just breaks everything because oh. your little action that you're animating is stored in a file somewhere. So she needs to yeah. linking everything. And I don't know. It just, it just sounds like so uh, less prone to errors. <laughs> so safe. Well, it's basically what USD is doing as well, right? You have a scene that is just built up from a text file that refers to other text files that refers to other text files. But the scene itself is, is rather simple, actually. Nice. Super nice. So uh, we should <laughs> start using this. We should watch your tutorial and uh, uh, start doing yeah. it as well. So uh, next question, uh, Miguel says, Hi, Pablo. Happy Blender 2101. Thank you. Will everything in Notes have Notes for rigging? Yes. Well, Someday. otherwise it's not everything, right? Yes. Everything nodes will have nodes for everything. Uh, yes, eventually. It's no yeah. dates. But uh, the first step, as we know, is particles, which actually are coming in the next blend, next next Blender release 2.90. And um, after that, I think it's just maybe modifiers. And basically, it's hard to tell what it would be after that, because maybe another developer wants to pick up. Once the base system is there for the functions, the basic core stuff like math nodes and adding and removing and like dealing with data <laughs> once all the basic stuff is there particles are gonna use it modifiers modeling anything so it's hard to tell maybe we have like a developer like jumping out of nowhere it's like hey i love this i'm gonna make it for whatever well i think at least constraints are are typically something you could do very well with nodes and i think that will also simplify our constraints because now some constraints have to do things and then copy something to another constraint like code wise uh -huh. like there's a lot of shared code between those constraints because they all try to solve the same issues whereas if you're working with nodes you can just split that up into different nodes and things keep stay simpler and i think will also be easier to understand so and to debug maybe if we have presets um especially yeah next uh, question is actually two questions by Mehman is when will shadow pass introduce shadows of objects in compositing shadow pass introduce shadows of objects like a shadow catcher uh, no shadow pass introduce I don't know uh, shadows have shadows from objects and everything maybe it's a yeah. shadow ca catcher I'm not sure and uh, maybe yes sorry Maybe there's, uh, I, I'm not that familiar with all the compositing and different passes, but maybe the shadow pass is the shadow on an object, not the shadow of that object. On an object. Okay. Like, well, yeah, shadow on an object when there's nothing, like when there's something blocking the light, basically, or when there's no light being put on there. Yeah. So not familiar with that basically but uh, no. shadow pass basically now introduces everything unless you exclude something um from it like uh, using the, the the outliner when you are in cycles uh for example that you can do uh, visibility and then for example um sorry view layer set indirect only or as one one example um will blender 3mf uh 3MF file format, like support 3MF file format. I just looked it up quickly. It's a new 3D printing format based on XML. Um, and because Blender has uh, Python bundled and Python has built-in support for XML, it, it, it should be doable to, I don't know anything about the format, but it should be doable to write an import and exporter for it uh, as an add-on. So yeah. it doesn't even have to be inside of Blender itself. Somebody can just go ahead and develop an add-on for it. Actually, most of uh, <laughs> Blender imported exporters are add-ons. Yeah. If you look at the, the, the category where they are, most of them are add-ons, which I actually have disabled. Like, I know, actually, no, I, I just started my settings, but I have disabled just because I don't use them as, as often. But yeah, yeah this, is, this is I, uh, writing an, an important and exporter. It's a nice exercise even for people that want to get into Blender. Yeah. So maybe <laughs> the, the answer will be like, maybe it depends on the, it's not on the focus of the Blender Foundation, but it's if somebody wants to do it, it's definitely welcome, especially if being open source. And third question, 
and a feature for Blender snapping option, snapping to vertex, X, Y sliding. This is also something that has been asked every week. Um, I don't know exactly if there is uh, uh, someone working on it at the moment. Uh, but yeah, it's being requested every week. Uh, Juan asks, hi there, question for Sivren, but also any cycles or depths craft developer. Hi, Dr. Sivren. <laughs> Second. Hello. That was the first. Second. There is a <laughs> thing we need. Animation in links. But there is a big problem. I know overrides will come and it may allow us to override the frame range of an Alembic file. That would be great. But will overrides work in a way that the instant status will be respected? The target of this is to have one tree, the face the animation and instance that one tree a thousand times. We remain with one tree in memory, but all the 1000 trees animate at a different time. Yeah. Yeah, that is, I think, as far as I understand, that is very much the one of the goals of the override system. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes, <laughs> uh, eventually when it, when it comes, but yeah, it's one of the goals. Third and final question. Can we, uh, can't we evaluate modifiers in instances before sending it to render? Evaluate modifiers. Right now. Yeah, right now if an instance object has a modifier, the instance memory saving feature dies. Um, the idea would be to have a flag that can tell this instance modifier should be evaluated before we send it to render. Uh, Wait, what uh -huh. he means by instance, like actually it's not a real instance, and a Blender instance is an empty with a dupli, basically. Um, but what he says basically is using uh, linked meshes. Once they have, uh, when they are not uh, when they don't have modifiers is saves memory once at the moment they have a modifier on they lose the memory saving feature that's what it means i would i wouldn't know i would have to know more about the specifics of what he's asking because there's many ways in which you can do instancing you can also have a particle system you can have uh multiple objects sharing the same mesh uh and there's all kinds of different ways in which things can be optimized and things can be improved. I'm sure of it. Um, yeah, he is actually on the live chat. Bone Studio is here. The one you create with Alt D. Yes, exactly. And um, also he points out that if we use oh, the right. yeah. object option, so that's uh, slots. that's uh, a, uh, not really. An, yeah, it's just a, a, a different object that uses the same mesh. Um, I think. So, but yeah, then indeed, like the object is the thing that evaluate that has the modifier stack and that has the evaluated mesh. Um, so we would have to find a way to figure out that all these objects actually have the same uh, mesh, the same um, uh, modifiers on them, that they have the same options for those modifiers, that if they are animated, that they are animated with the same values and there's a lot of ifs that of go into checks, this. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard to optimize. So um, export, but, <laughs> cache it, Alembic everything, USD everything. Well, may maybe some. I've I've been thinking about um, more caching for for animation system and everything. So maybe that would be a way to do it. Indeed, uh, we have to make that easier, of course. Maybe there would be some special modifier in the stack that just says cache everything up to here oh and maybe that also has an, an option for instances that say that cache can be reused by all the instances uh something like that yeah but wouldn't that be uh, automatic when would you wouldn't want it to be automatic the caching like if you had a modifier for caching and say well you, you always trade stuff right i mean uh, it will never like you can use caching to make things faster, but I'd rather make Blender in such a way that you don't need caching. Ah, okay, yeah, but that that's like the ideal. Work. Yes, exactly. But if so, you need a modifier to tell cache up to here, um, it could just be done automatically, I guess, as much as possible. Whatever can be done, I don't know, in the GPU, for example, do all of those, and then okay, after that, uh, use CPU. Sure, but. Um, 
like one one cool thing would be if you have a stack of modifiers and the first two are always the same for every object that uses that particular mesh you could cache the result on the mesh and then only have it once and then the rest of the modifiers are run per object and if you want to have control over where that distinction is between once for all users and then once per object then you have to have something in that stack that maybe it's not a modifier maybe it's just a line that you draw somewhere or maybe this is done after we implemented modifier node and it's just a node that you plug in somewhere uh, like there's many ways in which we can go thank you for your input and for your question bone studio exactly there yeah, bone studio says exactly all caps control everywhere <laughs> yes controlling control that's the ultimate thing i guess so next question says damian hi pavelo and the lie correction hello dr stevens to all yeah the lie was gonna be here but he couldn't last minute so uh uh, I was gonna oh. do it solo, but Siren showed up. I didn't want to bother. So, very nice. Uh, so, any news about adaptive cloth? Are there any plans to fix the limitation in baking with a particle system? Baking cloth with a particle system? Or bake... I don't know. And baking particles and hairs to texture. I don't know if that is one question or three questions. <laughs> the adaptive yeah. cloth i don't haven't uh, read anything uh, about it do you know if there is any patch no 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 i don't um maybe I, there are so many patches nowadays going into like in blender you can see uh on, on developer.blender.org that some of them uh, sometimes get lost uh but no i haven't seen that and also fix the limitation in baking not really um, with a particle system but whatever anything that is particle related it has to wait until like there will be no development until the particles hair, like node particles are part of blender which they will be in the coming weeks if you want to learn more about the time of uh, the time for everything for example you can go to developer.blender.org and then uh, you can click on uh, blender 2.83 to see for example here the, the schedule for 2.83 but if you want to see the future you can go back one level and you can see 2.90 here, milestone. And once you're here, you're gonna see that beta starts of Blender 2.9 starts on July 8. So July 7, <laughs> it's gonna be a crazy day, but I think everybody will start <laughs> tapping everything there. Hopefully earlier yep. for more testing, but basically, uh, yeah. That would uh, that would be exciting to see. Uh, next question, Reston says, "Hey, are there any plans to improve the Python API in underdeveloped areas like the file browser or the outliner?" I don't know. That file browser has seen and the outliner both have seen quite a lot of development recently, so I don't really understand why it would be underdeveloped. Um, one of the issues I do know that with the outliner, it's very performance sensitive. Mm. So I think most of that is uh, written in C. Because if you have a lot of uh, objects in your scene, then drawing them every time in that outliner, or even selecting which ones to draw, which ones not to draw, uh, that can be quite heavy. So that's why you have very little Python API right there, because it's all written in C. Yeah, because of performance. Yeah, Joseph in the chat says adaptive remesh Google Summit of Code project. Hey, remesh is a different thing. It's not about this cloth, I think. And also every Summit of Code, there is like 18 projects. Yeah. It's not easy to remember all of them. Every yeah. year since 2005, there has been a Google Summit of Code. So give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> kidding um all right so next question can we get a video showing how to set up flamenco outside of blender cloud <laughs> with a link to openq.io thank you very much um <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i i um i don't know i've never set up blender like flamenco outside of blender cloud is it a little Me work if you know a little <laughs> <laughs> but you know like Flamenco, I've... you developed for it, so do you, like, for an average person that knows 
uh, maybe a little bit of I don't know Django or, or Docker or it is it is hard to set up uh, that's for sure it was not meant to easily set up um, I at some point I would like to go back to Flamenco and make the server component optional actually oh so that you can do like pretty much everything that we do now on the server you do on the manager and uh, the server would then just be an optional component that could be very useful because then the whole team in the, can can be there it has one web interface you can manage stuff there as well um but by having an optional it just reduces the overhead so much for installing a standalone copy of flamenco and i think it's very doable but that does mean that first i have to implement like the whole task list that i have now for blender <laughs> and then maybe look at uh, flamenco, flamenco. Yeah. one of the co one of the goals is, is also that it would then be useful for the studio when our uh, internet connection dies that we can still use flamenco even when we can't reach the server uh, that we can still submit new jobs and just work as uh, as we want to so even for us who have our own blender cloud like it would be, it useful. Would be useful so yep so uh, next question, my Mick, Mike says, Hello Pablo, do you think there will ever be a shadow catcher for Eevee? Yes, I think so. Like in ever. That is a very, that gives a lot of room to breathe. But yes, I think a shadow catcher for Eevee should uh, be eventually be possible. Next question, Reston asks, is better mobile web support for Blender community coming in the uh, web up update? You're getting married? Oh, I didn't say that, but actually, uh, with myself, oh. I actually, I met, I, I know myself for 33 years and I like him. I like my, I like me. So <laughs> I think I'm going to take the next step and marry myself. Uh, so it's, um, it's better mobile web support. So, okay. Basically, um, this is talking about, it's very meta. It's talking about Blender community, which is the website that runs, uh, Blender like Blender community. It's a software that we made with Francesco that has been like for many iterations. First, it was only Blender today. Then it became more of like a, a community of sites. This is version number three. What you see here is based on the Blender cloud software. So actually, if you look at the cloud and you look at like, I don't know, the comments, uh, you're going to see that they are very similar. <laughs> um, I don't know if nobody ever um, like noticed. But the, but yeah, the, the, for example, the comments, they and the features, they look exactly pretty much the same as uh, Blender Community. That's because place it, the 3D cursor between oops. the temple and the end of yeah. the jaw oops. and create. Here, I was uh, listening to Julian talk in the background. So anyway, it's the same system, but we it's a bit too heavy for what we want to do. So we actually rewrote the entire Blender Community website with Francesco in the last year. It's been a year of this project. And we are making it more like a social network um, kind of a thing where you can actually like more tailored to what we are doing. Before it was like trying to sh like get the cloud into become this. Now we are just making this. So version four <laughs> will land later this year. And for example, if you type capital T, power phi, whatever, we could very easily uh, parse this and link to a task, for example, or um, also better support for for all the websites and the communities we have, like Graphical and Right Click Select. So yes, to answer the question, yes, um, later this year. Next question. So we are a bit out, uh, after an hour, actually, but I think we can manage to answer all the questions that were here. If you are not in a hurry, is it okay? Uh, okay, we, we're <laughs> almost done, we're almost done. One of the features, so the question by David asked, uh, one of the features for animation that I've been waiting for is the ability to select bones by selecting the mesh. Yep. So, yep, that's... Uh, face maps. Yep. Yes. That's very cool stuff. Um, I don't have any updates to to talk about because I'm not really on top of this feature, but it is something that we really want to have. Uh, so we're also excited to uh, to have that in our future. Yeah, um, but um, so you, how long have you been the, the module owner 
developer of the animation stuff. Two years now. Two years, congrats. <laughs> Thank you. That's yes, awesome. no, yeah. That was, uh, I think that, no, wait. Shorter, one year, I think. Uh, because it it was during the first or the second code quest. And huh. I think Well, the first code quest the was two years ago. It sounds like yeah, five, exactly. it looks like, it feels like five years ago, but actually the code quest was April 2018. 18, yes, the inauguration of our new building. Yes, and when I moved to this house, actually, and everything, and so many changes in life. So, yeah, um, yeah the, the year after we had um, the second code quest, which was much smaller. And uh, this year we yeah. can't even think of a code quest because we're all locked up. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's uh, hope for a 2021 cold quest. Absolutely. All right. Um, so next question to answer is like uh, by, by Chant Dramolis. Hi, Pablo. I just love what Blender has developed into today, especially the sculpting tools. Thanks to the sculpt dev God, Pablo Dovarro, and the support of all the other developers that review his code and give feedback and the foundations that were there before for Blender. So yes. give credit to everybody, please. <laughs> I have issues and the people supporting the fund, Blender Development Fund. So the question is, I have issues with remeshing fingers without the fingers getting fused, even with a very low voxel size. Uh, so regarding the voxel remesher, so um, are there any plans to improve the voxel remesher? Voxel remesher just takes your mesh and it splits it into like a, a voxel, so like a grid, like a volume. So there is really no way of getting around the parts of the mesh that are not supposed to touch to, to touch. Um, so improvement, I don't think anything is planned on that. Maybe we can ask uh, Pablo when Pablo Dovarro when he's here next week. But th the voxel remesher is basically a library, OpenVDV, that got into the um, converting these uh, meshes from a, based on a volume. So I think it's just the nature of how things how that works. Next uh, question. So hi, Pablo. I wanted to ask, should the UV editor have an overlay panel similar to the one in the 3D viewport? Personally, I think it makes the UI a little more consistent across Blender. Also, I have been seeing people praising Pablo on the work done on Multiresc, but not enough people praising Sergey and Campbell, who also work in refactoring. Yay. Yes. I mean, of course. Uh, I mean, pa Pablo is doing an amaz amazing job, but it's... Um, Maybe it's because Sergey doesn't have Twitter. <laughs> so hashtag Sergey on Twitter, hashtag Campbell on Twitter. Um, it's it's really doing a lot of a, a like crazy amount of work. Be before that, uh, Brecht also gave feedback. Brecht worked on the very first version of the multi-resolution uh, modifier. Um, Campbell worked on the mesh system. Um, I don't know from people working in the everywhere in from the UI to undo for undoing the multi rest then that is Bastian work and everybody works on it and the people also helping and testing on those features and the developers the artists everybody really it's uh, working on this so thank you for giving uh, credit where it's what is due it's a it's really an effort of everybody in the community Adam asks, Hi Pablo, I made a post on DevTalk. I didn't know it was a paper cut or lost feature, but I wish if we could take it, we could have it back with some improvements. So the improvements are, um, it's a paper cut. This thread has 3,700 <laughs> comments. Oh. So, okay, let's see if we can see it very quickly. In 2.7, there were some settings for the 3D gizmos where I can change their size to be larger, but their handle, handless, handlers remain small. Um, in 2.8, everything becomes too big. Here's a video for what I mean. Uh, yeah, I think in the now in 2.8, everything becomes big, especially the handles. Yes, I think it was more like a eek. What is that? Oh, it's 2.7 with a uh, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you want the widget to be large, but the controllers to be small. Um. Yeah, it could be... I think it was a fix more than a design choice. 
Uh, but I mean, if but enough people. That's with every design fix, right? Then there's always people asking for the the old way. No, but also maybe there is a lot. Of, there were reports in 2.7 saying like, "Hey, when I scale, it doesn't scale the the controllers." Yeah. So, um, yeah, options. Uh, but good, good to uh, mention it. I didn't know actually know about that one. The next question by Matias. Hello, people. Wondering if this new multi res will enable users to bake displacement maps, or is that part of another project? It's a part of another project, I think, because the displacement, the baking, I think, only works on the base level and not on the higher levels. I think, but I don't have. I have much experience with displacement as I do with driving a Formula One <laughs> car. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next uh, question what about e cycles it renders so fast and makes cycles almost as fast as EV with a way better result will you improve okay, it's not fast as EV uh, will you improve cycles based on e cycles performance and result if e cycles is code is shared on developer.blender.org and available for review then yes it could be a uh, it, it could be reviewed I think but as long as the code is not available for everybody to see and see exactly what it does and uh, it's, it's hard to tell and also remember that has to be compatible with all graphics cards and not only Nvidia hacks or AMD hacks or uh, just maybe um, I don't know removing some safety checks from cycles to make it uh, to make it render faster but actually less consistent for animation um, the code has to be available, that is the first step, so everybody can test it and work on it and review it. Nothing should happen behind curtains. Next question, Sibos yeah. 3D. Hi, hey guys, congratulations on the show. Now that the material inputs in the properties panels are colored and on the left side, what we saw yes uh, earlier, uh, do you think it would be a good idea to also include on the right side the icon to easily insert keyframes? That's there. Yes. It was added today by Julian Iso. <laughs> so thank you Julian it's now there so compile update and compile and the last question so we wrap it up even though you got a new beer but yes Sean Becker asks how would you approach making macros for blender functions that is a great question for you yes uh, well there is a, a macro uh, operator I think that you can program to uh, to, to execute like different operators in sequence. So there's um, an operator to make to control sequence operators. Ah. Yes. Um, but I've never used it myself really because I just write a Python script that that does everything for me. Um, some people also with macros they think of say uh, Photoshop actions or word markers of word macros where you click on a record button, then you do stuff and then you save what you did um, and that is very hard I think to get right when it comes to Blender because if you click on the the third object well did you click on the third did you want to have the third or did you want to have the object with that particular name oh. uh, if you say if you change uh, the, the material color to red did you want the first material or did you want the material with that name uh, do you want the first note to become red or do you want to have the diffuse color of whatever note with that name? Like how you address things. Uh, do you want to have the scene with name scene or do you want to have the current scene? Yeah. Um, and in one case, you really have your named your scene in a specific way and you really want to access that particular scene. In other cases, it really doesn't matter. It just has to be the current scene. Um, so all this knowledge it's really hard to record and then have it right. Unless it's like very verbose, right? Like very down to the point or almost using like UID, unique IDs for addressing everything. Uh, but yeah. But right now what you can already do is just hover over a menu item, press Ctrl C, then go to your Python script, press Ctrl V, and then you have the Python call that was ex would be executed by that function so yes and remember that there. every step you do every step you take 
I'll be watching you and uh, the <laughs> the uh, I will be or the info editor will be recording everything so you can see actually what's going on and you can right click copy or control C and then uh, paste it on your own scripts so you can easily get a little bit of more uh, a bit ease and uh, or if you want to learn yeah. more about how to make your own operators I know a guy go to scripting for artists yay <laughs> scripting for artists which is the free training done here on this channel Blender Foundation YouTube channel where Sivran our guest goes through all the things that you would even imagine ever imagine for customizing blender for making your operators even uh, some four versus wild that is actually a, a python thing yeah so uh but i thought it was a really interesting question so we just talked about it absolutely um also another reason by the way that i just think of now why i would i hardly ever use that info panel to to copy paste stuff from oh. is say you want to move something you want to move an object three units in the x direction for example if you do that with operators it becomes really hairy and tricky and you got like a big chunk of python code to to do that yeah whereas if you program that in python it's just object.location.x plus equals three and then it's incremented by three yes you need to learn a bit of scripting in python you need to learn a little bit more but your life will become much easier if you want to automate things. Yes, because here, for example, it's not using the location X and moving it. It's basically a transform or translate, which, and, and, and the issue is that it also shows all the arguments of that operator are displayed in the info yeah. editor. There were some proposals yes. by, uh, I think it was Willem, the Blender UI team, um, about displaying this in a better or a easier uh, to understand way uh, maybe as a list or maybe even all the default values could be like hidden by default and then just show what actually changed or I don't know it could be it could be a bit mm. smarter um, but the best thing is to learn a little bit of Python and what better than using scripting for artists yes which... especially the first chapters are really about this um, and they're not available for free on YouTube because I made them two years ago. Um, more over two years ago, even because it was still the old Blender Institute. And but they really go through the basics of Find scripting in Blender. So that is on cloud.blender.org slash scripting for artists. Exactly. I'm actually uh, showing a little bit here where we can see. Wow, you look uh, younger. I guess it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think we can wrap it up. It's one hour, 17 minutes that we've been doing this live stream. So I think it's a, it's a good moment to wrap it up. Thank you, Sivran. One, but sorry. One final thing about scripting for artists yes. that may be interesting for, uh, for this channel, just to have one day where we have like an interactive scripting for artists uh, Q&A, where people can just ask their scripting questions and we go through it and see if we can answer them and write some code and then go through the API. Wednesday, we do code dives in the, this channel. Do you want to be my guest? Sure. Yeah. All right. So code dive on Wednesday, next Wednesday, which is the 6th of May. At the same time, same place, we're going to do a uh, code dive in the Python part of Blender. So. We're gonna go through the scripting for artists tutorials and just uh, have a, a Q and A mainly on like people yeah. and get all the questions answered. Do you get many comments uh, asking stuff in the in the videos? That maybe we can yeah, grab. Like, most of the comments are just ah, this is cool or uh, things like that. Uh, but sometimes really people ask questions uh, mostly on Blender Cloud actually uh, about like, well, I've got this bit of code and it's not working. Do you know what's going on? Um, usually I can help them, so that's pretty cool. Awesome. And the great thing is that you can also answer some questions that are maybe even not even Python related, but also like actual Blender code related, or maybe uh, maybe somewhere in between, you know, yeah. like talking with yeah. the Python part and the other uh, part. So that, that's all right. So we got a date <laughs> for Wednesday. We do. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. Cool. Um, great. Uh, 
I, I had a great time. Thank you for dropping in very last minute. Yeah, uh, my so, pleasure. Sorry for the short notice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it turned out very nice. Uh, we answered every question, all 24 questions that were asked there. We went through every feature covered last week. So I would call this one a success. Yes. All right. Thank you, Sivran. Have a great weekend. Thank you. And you too. And everybody at home, thank you for staying in until the end. Like 400 people get some point. Yeah, amazing. Like she's, she's looking at it. So. Thank you for, for hanging out with us. It's been a great episode. Share with your friends or non-friends that <laughs> you think that may enjoy this kind of content and let them know if they're into development that on Wednesday, this play at the same time, same place, same channel, we're going to be doing a live stream on Code, Blender, Python, Scripting, Artists for I don't know. <laughs> 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 wild. Wild. <laughs> exactly. Everything. All right. So, uh, All right. oh, you can hear it, but we're going to go out with uh, Epic. Oh, maybe I can turn on the speakers uh, very low so you can maybe pick it up. In 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. Sunny cool. See you soon in the next video. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye.